need to be more assertive about telling people how their name is said and then they give up. There we go. All right. This is John Reed live from Constellation Connected Enterprise 2019 with Trisha Wong from Sun and Compass. How are you doing? Are we actually live or is this we, pre-recorded? Well, this is recorded. We are not live. Okay. Well, I will be producing it, but we are live in the moment. Okay, uh, do you great. get it? Okay. You can edit out <laughs> terrible things that I say. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, but you're not going to say anything like things. that. Any, well, we're not going to do that. Am I allowed to use curse words? You can I, curse, you can can curse if you see fit. Okay, great. So the reason Trish is here, we have an interesting history dating back a number of years. To be fair, I really owe her an article, but that's a whole different story. But she's also one of the most... Um, I you think, don't owe me anything. All right, fine. She's also one of the most interesting thinkers in the entire enterprise space, particularly around the problem of, of data. She's an outspoken critic of a lot of data practices, and we're going to get into why. And we're going to talk a little bit about her beef with CX because that's that's been an emerging buzzword that has a lot of fundamental flaws. And we're going to then go into what you're doing about all of this. Just to kind of get people oriented, we're at Constellation's Connected Enterprise event, which gathers several hundred CXOs, eclectic individuals in a strange enterprise community. But but it's always interesting conversations. Have you learned anything interesting this week? Oh, I've learned so many things. I mean, the thing about Ray is that he always gathers a really fascinating community together. Yep. And that's why you learn interesting things. So you get people with philosophy backgrounds to, you know, who are actual, you know, programming, you know, algorithms. But because of their background, they're able to have these interesting, you know, insights. But one of the most controversial things that I was so happy to have heard on stage was my discussion with Jana Eggers, where Jana said, you know, I don't think that emotions can be programmed into algorithms, into computers, into artificial Mm. intelligence. And that is really, really controversial for her to say, because, you know, there's a lot of work that's being uh, done around the unconsciousness. And can you, can we Mm. make computers conscious and how do we tap into the conscious and, and outsource it to computers? But I think she gave a really convincing argument for why you can't do that. And Mm. that was, that was, I think there were some gasps in the audience. Yeah. And, and uh, you were on a panel, I think, around, was it ethics? and I was on a panel with ethics uh, and AI, and then also I was on Andrew Nevis's panel that he did really well, where he got a really eclectic group of people together also. And I think there was a really great conversation there where I was really continuing what Jenna was saying, because, you know, the... The brilliant genius Brent Wall, who's, you know, the father of fractal geometry, has been, you know, doing really amazing work on imaging the brain. And he's really pushing the boundaries of what can be done, you know. And but, you know, I, I, it was important that I say, you know, be, thank you, Brent, for explaining everything that you've done. But we have to be careful to not conflate just because you can visualize the brain that we can actually understand the brain. Mm. You know, because a lot of times people get mesmerized with like, oh, my God, well, look, Brent's work. You can actually see what people are dreaming about and you can know what people are going to do. And I'm like, you actually don't know what their dreams mean. You have no context of why they had this dream. So we have to be very careful. And we're seeing the same problems in facial recognition around AI, around mm-hmm. emotions. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there who can claim they can understand your emotions just based on uh, being able to have you know, images, computer vision of your face. And that is really problematic because mm-hmm. we don't express emotions the same way culturally. And to think that you can mathematically represent something that we don't understand yet is very dangerous because then those decisions, when scaled out, uh, there's a lot of risk associated. You can see how it can create a cascade of issues. And so I'm very concerned about how companies are assuming that they can mathematically represent things that are actually incredibly fuzzy and that are also changing because maybe you can mathematically represent at that one point in time, but it's an ongoing, you know, we're in a dynamic system. (laughs) Human emotions are dynamic. Right. And the ethics of design, I think, has been sort of a constant theme of this of this conference, right? In that if you adopt these next gen technologies without understanding the undertow and the implications of the the casualties of that technology, then you're then you're really have gonna have a problem. And that was I think a pretty constant theme this year. Totally. So what I wanted to get into is the way I kind of think about you uh, from how I originally got to know you, you did a a uh, really cool talk at Enterprise UX. Yeah. Shout out, shout out to Lou Rosenfeld, Lou who, Rosenfeld. who's such a great guy who organized really this is. show. He's a standout guy. In he is space. absolutely. Truly. If Lou you don't Lou know Lou. who Lou Rosenfeld is, you should look him up. But um, and go to his their annual conference, Enterprise yes. Experience. I think it's one of the few unique spaces. But you had a really cool presentation called "Solving Not Sexy but Important Problems," which I think was 
spot on. I think of you as having an ethnographic approach to data. That talk is not on YouTube because you you had it pulled down because you didn't like the sound quality. Remember? Because remember the AV was right. there. But right. but you need to give that talk again. So yeah, you need it. to go back on that one. But you do have a couple related talks. So if folks do a search of Trisha Wong on YouTube, there's a couple other related talks that are still up. Um, but so you have a fundamental critique of how companies are approaching big data. What is that? Companies think that if they just get more data, they're going to make better decisions. And I'm that has been my life's work to show them that just because you're gathering more quantitative data does not lead you to better decisions. In fact, it can lead you to make more risky decisions and dangerous decisions. And the worst part is it can lead you more, uh, it can lead you farther away from your customer. Is that more customer data can lead you farther away from your customers. And it's a total conundrum, but I have seen it time and time again in companies and no one, a very few leaders want to talk about this big white elf in the room because what it is, I'm tackling this entire vendor industry that is swearing that they can help clients find that needle in the haystack about their customer. If they just buy that dashboard, they're going to get all of their customer data, their CDP, their DMP, all of everything into a big lake, and they're going to be able to make all the decisions they want to bring their company to the next level of growth. And that there is a lot of, it's just not happening that way in reality when you actually go inside companies. Right. And you, you describe yourself as a technology ethnographer. What does that mean? So ethnography means the science of studying people. And mm -hmm. I just so happen to study pe how people use technology. And I made up that job title because there was no job title that fit me because actually my work crosses marketing, it crosses digital data and design. So I was like, well, how do I actually fit myself into any one of these functions? And so instead of making the job title fit me, I was like, well, why don't I make up a whole entire new job? I, instead of making myself fit the job title, I was like, I'm going to just make something new that is not even out there so that I can actually just talk to people about what it is that the problems I'm trying to solve mm. and the problems I'm trying to solve are around people and technology and how do we get, how do we leverage all this amazing technology? A lot of people think I'm against big data or against technology. I mean, no, I love quantitative data. I think we can do amazing things now, but we can't just only say, well, all we need is quantitative data. Or all we need is mm. this one piece of technology. That's just magical thinking. We have to right. think about this in an ecosystemic approach. So we're going back a few years now and some of this when when big data was a little bit more, I think people have stepped off the big data hype, and, but but it still kind of ties into what we're going to talk about today. But what, in the in the prior critiques that you issued, you had said over 73% of big data projects aren't even profitable, which is an interesting point that sort of illustrates that this has not been some kind of magical solution. But then you you encapsulated a point that I think about a lot, which is, why do companies have so much trouble making good decisions from what they learn? Um, and one of the things you said in your talk, and I'm just going to read this for the audience, you said, um, most examples, things fall apart in decision making. The insight loses fidelity as it goes up what I call the alignment journey. A truly new insight or idea gets distorted, and through each step of the hierarchy as people try to tack it on to what the business is already doing through a PowerPoint on top of another PowerPoint on top of another one. <laughs> By the time these insights actually even make it up to the decision makers, they somehow feel less powerful and transformative. And anyway, I think that's a really good summary of like how, how this thing kind of falls apart. But then there's one more piece of it, which is this thing around these quantitative reports. They're missing a crucial piece, which you have referred to as thick data. So tell us more about that. Yeah, so, so yeah, 73% of organizations are not succeeding with their big data transformation. And Gartner's report just last year said that 91% of organizations have not yet reached a transformational level in their digital transformation. Why is this happening? Why are the numbers not getting better? You know, why are we struggling so much when we already have all the technology to collect, to warehouse, to store, and to analyze all the quantitative data that we have now? And part, and I know there's it's a complex answer, but... There's one big answer that is blaring, which is that all of these efforts, we're not able to learn from our quantitative data because we're missing an entirely other set of data called thick data. 
Mm. And that's qualitative data. And if you've never heard of thick data before, that's okay because I rebranded qualitative data, like mm. ethnographic data, stories, emotions, you know, firsthand, the firsthand as unmediated data as possible. I rebranded it thick data to sound sexy in a room full of data scientists who used to call my data set small because they'd be like, well, we surveyed or we mm. have collected you know, 5 million data points from all of this, from our first party data. And I would be like, yes, I have talked to 10 people and I have spent time, you know, but they're like, oh, you were just talking to what a small data set. And I'm like, no, I have, when I say talk, I'm really understanding their perceptions, their stories, what life is like in their shoes. And that's thick data. And for companies to think that they can only invest in quantitative data Mm. and actually try and grow their businesses without any of that thick data to me is ludicrous. And this is why I think the core problem is that is companies want to be data driven. Mm. I'm like the data is not going to tell you what to do. Data driven is actually the issue. We need to be insight driven. We need to understand mm. what is the insight that the data is telling us. And then that's going to, what's going to help as it help a decision maker act or make a decision. Yeah. You had a really great phrase in one of your talks where you just said, we've exaggerated the promises of the quantitative. And, and one of the really interesting examples you brought up in, in one of your um, YouTube gigs was um, around Netflix because Netflix made this important discovery around binge watching, not through quantitative research, not, but through qualitative stuff, what you call thick data. And think about how important that insight was to how Netflix has evolved since then, right? Because now binge watching is sort of like yeah. almost like a meme. But at the time, they had missed that yeah. through their quantitative exactly. research. And they actually had, you know, remember the big uh, million dollar contest where they said, mm. what alg- um, what uh, engineers out there can actually help us write a better algorithm to improve our recommendation, you know, mm-hmm. our recommendation algo. And it, and I think, you know, in the end, it didn't actually make a measurable difference in their recommendation with whatever teams that yeah. they submit. And it wasn't until they said, okay, we're going to actually go embrace thick data. They hired an ethnographer, a really well-known one named Grant McCracken, who went out there and just gathered thick data. What does that mean? He literally just hung out and spent time watching TV with families, watching media, understanding their daily lives. And that's when it emerged. He was like, wait a second. People are watching shows consecutively, back to back. And the, and the best part is they're not embarrassed about it. You know, before people would be embarrassed about it, but he was like, no, people actually, this is like protected time. And then they shut off and they actually want to binge watch. And then, so what that did was it changed the way Netflix designed how TV, how their next show popped up. Instead of giving you a recommendation for a different show, guess what their recommendation algorithm did? And you don't need an algo to do that. It's like, they were like, well, just watch the next episode and we're going to make it so easy. It's going to have autoplay, you know, and that's a, a great example of integrated data thinking. This is a new practice, a new skill set that we teach that we think is needed for the 21st century, which is the ability to integrate different kinds of data sets, in particular data sets that are on the quantitative level and also on the qualitative level. And you have to integrate that to tell a coherent story. And so this is why we're teaching companies um, and we're working with universities and also professional programs to really make sure that this is a new skill set that is taught and learned for how do you integrate qualitative and quantitative, the big data and the thick data. Because if you can do that, then you can start being able to play with different kinds of data sets to make better decisions for your customers. And there's one more piece that I want to get to here of your sort of foundational ideas, which is every company needs a department of the unknown. Tell us about that. Yes. So I, I think this is really critical is that companies are so good at getting, you know, at optimizing. They're really, I mean, you're really good at like maximizing your beta and making the, making, you know, I think it's called EBITDA and I'm, I've been spending a lot of time in the South America, so I call it EBITDA, but it's, here it's called EBITDA. And, you know, you, you really know how to make, to, to maximize value for your shareholders. There's certain kinds of mechanisms of financial reporting that are needed there. But those kinds of skill sets are great for optimizing the known. You already know the variables that you need to manage. For a company to not just survive, but to thrive in this era, 
because the world is so complex now and you have all new customers, right? All these new kinds of customers coming in new markets. You also have to know how to manage the unknown and not just manage it, but then take advantage of it and have the unknown drive your growth. Hmm. So every company needs a department for that. And I say it facetiously. It's like, I don't technically mean you have right. to create a department of the unknown, but what I mean is like everyone, you need to be, have people to say, you know what, you're in charge of bringing the unknown into the company and you're going to get the resources to be supported to do that because that's where we're going to look for growth and, and not in a siloed way. So I'm not just talking about like only an innovation lab and just throwing more money at there, but the company needs a department or a, a person or a group of people and processes and a culture that really knows how to ingest, uh, to find the unknown and to ingest mm -hmm. it into the culture and drive that into the business. Mm -hmm. And and you've built all of this critique into a methodology to help companies with these problems, and we're going to get into that. But before we do that, I have to ask you, uh, while we're deconstructing buzzwords, what is your beef with customer experience? The thing with, you know, I have, I mean, the reality is I love, I think it's important to focus on the customer experience. It is the most important thing because your customers aren't buying features. You know, they aren't buying your technology. They want to have an experience. They don't just want the story of you, right? And they're not just looking for the story of me, of themselves. They want good customer experience is the unification of you and me into a story of us. Great brands tell a great story of us. And that's what a great customer experience is. What I see happening now in the effort to for companies to say, we want to be customer centric. You know, we realized that we weren't customer centric and now we're customer centric. So guess what, how we're going to solve that? We're going to create a whole new head of customer experience and that's going to be called CX. And it's a whole new art and science. And we're going to hire a chief experience officer. And what it does, what I'm seeing it do inside companies is creating a whole new silo. And it's then creating a whole new set of problems because mm -hmm. that CX officer usually isn't empowered with an amazing team. They have to build, you know, it's not like, you know, they're connected to marketing as much or to all the other amazing parts of the organization that are doing a lot with the customer. And so my issue with is that we're treating it as if we were inventing a new thing as opposed to companies that do really good work on CX. Yes, they may have a head of CX, but that person is really embedded closely with all the existing departments that have been trying to be customer centric, but they're playing more of a connective tissue role and bringing a disruptive lens. But they're really saying, hey, like we're going to work with marketing or we're going to work with every part that's customer facing. We're going to bring them together. Mm -hmm. my, my thing is just that my beef is that we're treating this as if it's totally an, a new thing when actually we have, uh, you know, decades of experience within the enterprise of different parts of the org that have been very customer centric and very customer facing. But because of the drive, the pendulum swung to being, you know, data driven all the resources went away from marketing, from mm. research, um, from the parts of the organization that understood the customer to the chief data officers, the chief um, technology or information officers, the pendulum swung that way. So now instead of saying, hey, let's calibrate and find the middle ground and get all these teams to work together, we're creating an entirely new function called the customer experience function. And I just worry what I see happening. And my worry is well-founded because I get called in often to be like, we have a chief experience officer, but we don't know what happened. The chief customer experience officer, like why is it, why are our organizations and functions not playing well together? So you know, you see, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Are I mean, you I, seeing that? <laughs> yep. I mean, I, we could, we have to probably do a whole hour long podcast to get into all of my problems with customer experience. I tend to agree with you that the focus on customer is important. I'm going to, I will focus my critique on the area that I think ties in with some of the work that you're doing, which is that the problem I have is that, you know, I've always experienced brands to be pretty impersonal and inconsistent. And, and I navigate my way through that landscape. When someone tells me that they care about my experience, they are raising the bar. They are raising my expectation that now I'm going to have that. And, and the key there is unfortunately not delighting me today. It's being consistently coming through for me in the way that I need, which is a much harder challenge. You, anyone can delight someone on any given day if they yeah. get lucky or they figure out when your anniversary is or they send you like a uh, bouquet of flowers to your hotel room. But, but the consistency of that, anticipating what I care about, is a whole nother problem. And, and consistency is not possible without integrated data. You have to have data 
across all the different ways you interact with me because I expect that. I expect you to know what the support person said to me yesterday. I expect you to know what the concierge said to me today. I expect you to have access to your inventory data to know that you delayed a product that you were supposed to ship to me. I expect all of that. Otherwise, don't talk to me about customer experience. Just be a jerk like you always were, and I'll just understand that that's what dealing with brands is like. And so that's my problem is that they're upping the ante of my expectations without Uh having the technology and data platform to deliver on it. So that's my problem. But but now the goal is like, well, we have a customer, we have a CDP now, right? We have a customer data platform. Oh, the CDP. I don't, I that's a whole other topic, but like, where's Nicole France when we need her? I know she has an amazing article on the front page of Constellation about this. She just said, Nicole, if you guys um, go to the Constellation site, Nicole just did a takedown of, customer data platforms and the deep problems with, with that she has with them. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. Because, right. and, and the reason why these CDPs don't work out because, and is that off exactly what you just said is that the enterprise is so large now that they have siloed and cut you up as a customer and your data sets into the supply chain, into customer service, into yeah. marketing. So no, no function even knows how, what data they hold on you and they're right. not talking to each other. So the goal is what a CDP is going to solve all that. Well, let's not tackle that. Just go to Nicole's article. <laughs> for a start and maybe John will then write an article yeah, about this and I would exactly. love for him to take you know to really pull this apart yeah I, I think I do I do have one about how um, the algorithms are ruining customer experience which was kind of fun but anyway um, so uh one of the things that sort of gets back to your work is this notion that most companies are struggling with their data platforms. And, and I guess that's how you get pulled into the picture with your company, Sudden Compass. But tell me about like what happens here. Companies reach out to you. What are they struggling with? You know, most companies reach out to me and the C-suite is usually pulling me aside. And as if they say this with shame, either the CEO or the chief data officer says to me, look, you know, we invested in this vendor vendors, you know, and we got everything into the cloud. You know, everything is we moved it off prem and we did everything right. You know, we did all the check boxes of what the vendor told us to do. And they told us that we were going to make better decisions by collecting, by getting all of our data organized and cleaned up. And we're actually not seeing any breakthrough ideas. We're not seeing our teams move faster. And I actually don't know if I understand my customer any better. But they say this with great shame, as if like they're doing something wrong. And what I tell them is like, I wish I could start a support group for everyone who's bought technology from vendors and then not gotten what they wanted. You It'd know? be a pretty large support group, actually. Well, people have to, you know, yeah. be brave enough to come forward first openly. Because right now people are only come up, coming up to me one on one. And they won't even let me quote them publicly about this, you know? And most of them are just saying, look, we don't know what to do because we signed all these contracts and like we're now up for renewal. This is like millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars of money. And we're we're lost, you know? And, And I always tell them like, you're fine. You're actually not alone. You know, yes, you've sunk some money, but our work is we're data agnostic. We always say we're platform agnostic. We'll come in and that's great. You got everything one place. That's great. That's data 1.0 is just getting all focusing on the technology. And oftentimes some organizations are what I call data 2.0, which is a focus on getting the people who can use the platforms, right? To use a technology. So that's when you went, organizations went on hiring speeds for data citing, uh, data science unicorns. You know, and they threw them in the corners. They're like, oh, hopefully you'll solve a business problem. So that's data 2.0. You may have the talent in data 1.0. You have the technology. But data 3.0, that era, is not just about being data-driven. Because data 1.0 and 2.0 is all about being obsessed mm-hmm. with getting data and saying we, create, we have data-driven em- enterprise. You know, mm-hmm. data 3.0 is about insights, about how do we communicate with the data. Now that data is universal, it is pervasive within the organization. I did my job as a chief data officer. I got all the data in one place. But now... I have to make sure that all the functions can communicate with our data in such a way that makes sense for the customer so that you're, like in your words, consistently coming through for the customer. Mm. And that's a whole other level of work. That's data 3.0. And that's about needing a new way of of working. That's Mm -hmm. about new practices. That's about new communication. That's about new cultures of how you collaborate and share across functions. And that's about dealing with politics. You can't just live in your own silo. It's not just about adding a new CX, you know, role and then creating their own data uh, DMP. So that's yeah. that's the era that we work in as we try and get organizations into data 3.0 because we say you didn't waste your time doing all the stuff in 1.0, 2.0 of getting the talent and getting the technology mm-hmm. there. Great. Now let's actually get to the hard work, which is moving you from being a data driven enterprise to being an insight driven enterprise where you will consistently mm-hmm. come through for your customer. 
Yeah, I like how you've banished data-driven as a concept. Like, let's move beyond that and make better decisions. And before we stop talk, stop start talking about being data-driven, let's really show that it actually makes a difference. Um, one thing I wanted to get across, I mean, these are these are daunting problems, and I don't want to portray in this podcast that that anyone, including yourself, has all the solutions. To this, but I do think it. I do think it's important, though, um, for our discussion to make clear that you guys. At Southern Compass, you have developed a methodology around this. So, in other words, you've seen the depth of this problem, and you developed an approach that can help companies to work through it. And we won't get into all of that today, but you, we've walked through it before. But uh, you have a thing called you called Unlock Sprint, and then you have integrated data thinking, which is part of this. But basically, you're combining things from design thinking, agile, and lean, um, and you're going through a process of having companies ask, acquire analyze and then act on data that's kind of that's sort of a very very short version of of what it is you do um but what i wanted to sort of get into there is how how does that work uh for 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 some of your customers like how do they get started with this and 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 how do you plug that into plug their problems into your framework how does that go yeah, so what our framework is, is, is essentially it's a practice. It's saying, mm -hmm. you know, one of the problems we identified in the 21st century for a data-driven enterprise is that you have so many functions coming together wanting to work with data, but they weren't speaking the same language, not mm -hmm. the same level of data literacy. You have engineers coming to work for quant side, you have qual researchers you know, coming from the ethnographic side, and then you have decision makers who are like, just give me the graphs, give me the charts. And so what we did was we created a practice, and when I say we, I'm talking about Matt LeMay and Sunny Bates, those are my business partners, and we come from a long history of working inside organizations where we saw, increasingly saw the problems of people only wanting to rely on numbers to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's what I call, what I, I coined the term, is called quantification bias, which is the topic of my next book. And right. this is about how comp the dangers of over-relying on numbers to make decisions. And one of the things we said was, you know, we have to find ways to get companies to see that they need thick data. How do we get them to see it for themselves? It, you know, we don't, we can tell them they need it, but how do we surface that? And how do we enable employees, not just leaders, but employees and teams to actually identify problems that they need to solve in the product, in the business, so that they can create a better experience for customers? And so we said, you know what, instead of creating an agency or a consulting firm where we do the work for them, we created a practice where we enable people to fish themselves. You know, we don't need to do the fishing for them. So that's where we came up with the practice. It's called Unlock Sprints. And it's something that is just off the shelf that can be white labeled for any organization. And like you said, it takes the best of design thinking, agile and lean. And it creates an easy way for anyone, whether you have tons of experience to none in data, to have a shared language and a shared framework to understand what kind of question you're asking, whether you're optimizing or you're innovating, and then what kinds of what kind of methodology you need to take to go answer that question. And one of the things I liked, and you know, the thing you showed me on integrated data thinking is that it kind of pulls together things we were kind of punching holes in and stuff where it, you have the um, the quantitative and quali quantitative data, you have that all in the same framework and also unknown ish problems and known problems. And and so to your point, you're not necessarily trashing quantitative data or anything like that. No, what you need it. You what, absolutely need it what, to make what, decisions. What you're able to do is to kind of look at an organization and figure out where they fit into that and, and the nature of their problem. And if so, maybe a quantitative approach does work. But I thought what was compelling about how you showed it to me was that maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Like, is, like let's say I'm a client of yours. Maybe I think I need to sort of adjust a pricing scheme, but what I really need to do is to rethink what my audience is going to want in several years because it's actually changing. Exactly. That's what happened so. to Tesco. Tesco was like, oh, they hired a data science team. They became all data driven. And the data science team was like, oh, we have all this data now on our customers. We have we have the loyalty cards. We can we have historical data. Why do we can create lookalike models? Why don't we actually offer them personalized pricing? So you the price you pay for a banana is going to be different from what your neighbor pays. And they're like, we can do this because we know we have all the demographic data. We know how your income, we know your education level, how much you shop here. So we're going to create a pricing model. We're going to write an algorithm that determines what you're going to pay for different for each product. And it's going to be personalized to you because you want personalization, mm. right? That's customer experience, right? Mm. And they launched it and uh -oh. their customers flipped out. They were right. like, WTF, why am I paying something different from yeah. what who, my Just neighbor Just give me is? my banana. Just give me my yeah. banana. And so their their stock prices dropped. You know, a year in 2013, they launched all the data science stuff. 2014, they, their stocks 
tanked. That's the same year that Buffett sold all his Tesco stocks. And to this, in 2016, they experienced 6.4 billion pounds in loss, which is the biggest loss on a UK stock market uh, for you know, a company that's publicly traded there. So that's big, but that's exactly what happened is that the company said, you know, we're only going to, we're going to create a data model. We're going to go totally quantitatively driven, but they never pause to say, what is the human interaction model? What do humans think of this? What kind of qualitative data will we need to gather to make sure that we're taking the right approach so that we're designing the right kind of pricing model or even campaign? And this is why we created this practice, because we created something that you could learn in sprint-based mode about mm. your customers in an easy way. You can time box your sprints to either half a day to a week, whatever you want. But it forces you to say at each sprint, what kind of data do we need to answer the question that we have? So mm. that in the end, you should have collected a variety of data from quantitative to qualitative, you know, using all the data that you have and all the data you need to go gather to make the right decision for the business. Right. And what I think is also important here is that a lot of the most important data for this type of decision making is actually external to enterprise walls. I mean, the the classic example is weather, right? And the impact of weather data on all kinds of things pertaining to retail and individual consumer behavior and everything else. And, you know, so you you when you when you think about this, you have to think about it from that data platform perspective, because to your point, Otherwise, you're going to get ahead of yourself and you're going to head down this sort of data science direction. But maybe your data is clean, but it might still be too narrow. You know, clean is only part of the problem. If it's too narrow, you're missing something, you know. Just because it's measurable does not mean your data is valuable. Right. You have no idea what you may have all the right yeah. lagging indicators, but that's all lagging. That's all data you've already known to collect. Right. What about the leading indicators that are emergent that have yet not yet not been quantified? And yeah. this is why the quantification bias is so dangerous because it makes you think you already have everything. Right. <laughs> When you don't. When you don't. Right. And so so part of what your practice would be with a company would be to kind of pull back and kind of put the brakes on perhaps those forward surge of plans and kind of and and have a look at how this fits into the overall framework you developed and, and ask those questions. And have you done that qualitative research on this as well? And if they say, oh, we have, then of course, then you're good maybe. Then, then they know those answers. But if they don't, then they maybe ask some of those bigger questions and then they know that the the specific things they they work on are in a are informed by where their customers are really going. Exactly. So companies yeah. bring us in for what we call uh, often a, they request us to do what we call a data diagnostic. And so mm. we come in and we actually go and analyze. Do you have a practice to get your data together? You know, mm. do you do your do your um, employees and teams have a shared language or framework? And usually the answer is no. You know, and most importantly, the most important data not diagnostic that we do is they actually show us their data models. We actually say, show us your algorithm, show us the way you weighted your variables, show us the assumptions. What were your um, assumptions going in for picking this variable? Where did it come from? Where is it based off of? And when we start to ask why, 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 when you start to actually ask that question, most companies have not base their data models off of a human interaction model. It is based off of assumptions that the engineers or the business leaders made about what people would do. So in Tesco's context, they made an assumption in their data model that people would want personalized mm. pricing. There's nothing technically wrong with their algorithm. It was actually very beautifully written to do predictive pricing or for personal, you know, personalization. Mm. But the problem was they never actually understood that what is the human interaction model with trust and a grocery mm. store in a retail chain? Right. How will that affect your brand? And you, you, know? sh you showed me a, a slide that was called ethics in the stack. And the, the phrase that jumped out at me was build your data models off of human models. Yes. That's our number one thing. We have that poster hung up in all of our clients' walls. We give that away. Mm. I mean, that's the first and most important thing you have to do because in you know in the podcast when it's released, maybe we can include a picture of this. But if your data model is far from your human model, you should be really scared. You should be really scared because that means it's untethered from the actual customer mm. experience. I can physically, if I can visually and physically show you that your customer experience is untethered from your data model, you should be freaking mm. out. And most of our most people who actually do give us a chance and bring us in because I know what I'm saying is very controversial. So a lot of times leaders don't want to hear that, you know, because they want to think that all their data, all their quantitative data will, you know, bring them all the glory that they want. But when they bring us in, they actually are saying, wow, we actually get this. Now we know why hmm. that we have to start with the human interaction model. Because if you imagine the human 
interaction model and the data layer, that, those are just two layers. You have to make sure right. those are close as possible because by the time you add on the other layers of the business, of the enterprise, you have right. to add a business model, the legal model, the design, the product, the marketing, you know, the supply chain, customer service, all of these layers that start to play and actually bring a customer experience. If those things are all untethered and your stack is not as close and tight and unified as possible mm. to that human interaction model, you are not doing as well as you could be. I don't want to right. say you're screwed, but you're certainly not doing as well as you could I be. I think you did say that before we started taping. Okay, fine. So. <laughs> you can be screwed. And, and, and you see that happening yep. with a lot of things happening in the market where companies find start right. to realize, well, our product didn't perform as well, actually, so, it was dangerous. So just a real quick thing there. How can you tell when your data model is way off your human model? How do you figure that out? I figure that out just by asking why and if they can't explain the actual human interaction that in their evidence of how humans interact and that thick data, the actual evidence from stories and emotions that they've captured from the thick data research, then mm. all it is is just you, a bunch of engineers and business leaders or statisticians making assumptions mm. about how humans interact. And mm. also, I want to see what I, when we go inside organizations, we say, well, how do you update your models in real time? Because you may have, in, let's say in the best case scenario, someone says, actually, and this happens, you know, like, let's say someone made a data model and it's actually based off of a really great human interact interaction model, you know, like in Tesco's experience, maybe they did the research, you know, and they said, actually, people would trust us if there was variable personalized pricing. So that's why we wrote this pricing mm. algo, you know, this um, personalized pricing algorithm. And I'd be like, great. What are you doing to ensure that your not only your data is being updated in real time, but that your models are being updated in real time, your data models? Because humans are constantly changing. Mm. Something could happen next year or next month that would completely change the, the reason, your, the human interaction, all the ways that humans are you know, culturally interacting and all their ideas about personalized pricing. That may change. So that means your data model needs to be updated to actually reflect that. And most organizations yep. think they can just do point in time research without constantly making it a real time thing. There you go. Well, I want to get you to your next appointment, but real quick, you guys have this partnership with Google and you're going to be open sourcing some of your stuff. Yeah, Give we're me gonna a quick be, answer. To we're going to be open sourcing some of our materials around unlock sprints and in integrated data thinking so that you don't have to only just talk to us, you know, and bring cool. us in. But Matt and I decided that we're like, you know what, instead of, you know, we believe that this is so important that we would rather um, even give a crude version of instructions to put it out there so that organizations can start playing with this framework of integrated data thinking. You don't have to, you know, bring us in for a lab to use it, start trying it out. So you're going to see that in early December when Google Design Sprints. This is the whole team that Kai Haley and Felix has been working on relaunching the site to open source materials to the world. So I want to really thank their team for creating a platform so that you know mm. some of these materials around how do we improve the way we work with data can be more accessible to everyone. Because I don't think this should be something that should be kept secret or right. locked down only to you know a pay, pay to play kind of situation. So I'm really excited for the world to see get access to that. Cool. Okay. Very quick. Why are you obsessed with aviation? Oh my God. I think understanding aviation is they're one of the first industries to have introduced automation in a successful commercial way that customers are experiencing in mass. And so for us, it is critical to understand how a automation has entered into aviation. You know, planes used to be flown by crews of six to eight people. You know, you had to right. have each person actually calculating wind patterns and how do you land and like, mm -hmm. you know, changing the levers, right? And now it's been reduced to two people. But you know what? The goal is to reduce it to one. But I want to understand how did you reduce the crews from eight people to two people? And what are the cultures of cockpits? And how do people train? And how do people learn? Mm. And how do they keep it so safe? Why did they introduce it in such a safe way? And mm. I think if we can understand how automation entered right. the aviation industry, we can understand how it's going to successfully enter into our lives around self-driving cars and all these other areas. Right. And I would add, given certain recent tragedies, a, a really compelling part of that is what is the elegant way to combine automation and human intervention in automated systems? And I think aviation is a high stakes way of looking at that issue also. So exactly. it's a fruitful area. Yes. Looking forward to more thoughts on that. When I hear plates clanging in the background, I know that that's time for our podcast to end. We got to get to your appointment. Thanks. I'm really glad we finally made this happen. Later. Thanks,